Today we're going to have a brief look at the commonly heard claim that Britain is one of the most nature depleted countries on earth. And at the end we're going to have a look at a new thing I am doing which will involve having a look at channel analytics which is something I know people are always interested in. But I would like to start by discussing two comments. This person is writing from a true left wing viewpoint and they are requesting that I please help improve farming by selling more left-wing or alternative views like restorative farming, traditional farming based on permaculture, more agroforestry, forest garden type systems and even the NEP estate model. I think there is a lot of very strange stuff going on here. Ignoring anything I've ever said, just with a very rudimentary understanding of how the world works, is it not bizarre that somebody from the true left would be drawn to the NEPA state model. Not to be too idealistic, but if we are to imagine a utopia from anywhere on the left wing of the political spectrum, surely that world would not include estates at all. The owners of an estate typically survive off rent from workers, whereas in the NEPA state model they've dispossessed the workers and are instead subsidised by the government to own a capital asset that they don't work. And in defence of Isabella Tree and the other ideologues of the rewilding movement, I don't think at any point they've pretended to be left wing. If you read Isabella Tree's book, it is an attack on post war socialised agriculture. It says it's caused all of these horrific negative externalities, so we have to do something else. And that something else is to subsidise her to own land and not farm it. But apparently when true left people discover this ideology, rather than recognise it as an explicit attack on socialist agricultural policies, which it absolutely is, they read it and go, yeah, that's right, I'll support that. We will adopt this cause as our own. And then they write things like, farmers come across as backwards or uneducated and entrenched in their views, and those will be the ones that get taken over. I have no doubt that the person who wrote this has good intentions, but just to remind people, we've talked through the history of the countryside up to the establishment of the post-war consensus, the socialised agriculture that we've had in this country for decades. And I'm sure we can all agree that at least within the context of the time, those policies were reasonable. But the prevailing narrative today is that while those ideas were reasonable at the time, they don't work anymore. We now know that they have destroyed all of the nature. And this is something that you see time and time again. This comment is just one example. I'm sure you know the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries on earth. It appears in headlines in the media, it's used in campaigns. That particular phrase, the UK is the or one of the most nature depleted countries on earth is a great barrier to my attempts to make people think critically about environmental ideology. Although I would just like to say at the outset that there has undeniably been biodiversity decline, but I object to the idea that it's all farmers' fault. We are all collectively to blame for climate change, which means we don't really get cold snaps anymore, which interferes with the life cycles of plants and insects. We will investigate this in the future, but I digress. Where does this idea that Britain is one of the most nature depleted countries on earth come from? I understand it's from something called the State of Nature Partnership. This is a collection of conservationist organisations essentially. You've got Friends of the Earth, the National Trust, Natural England, people like that. Often these guys get a free pass because environmentalists are the good guys, but we have to remember that these are also a vested interest. They get enormous government handouts because people believe that nature is very important, and they also, on a basic individual level, like to maintain the moral high ground. So they must justify their work as something important and good. And together, they produce something called the State of Nature Report that runs the headline, the UK is now one of the most nature depleted countries on earth. This, I believe, is where the phrase comes from. The report says the main causes of these declines are clear, significant and ongoing changes in the way we manage our land for agriculture and the effects of climate change. So the blame is first on farming, land use change, and then on emissions generally. But while this most nature depleted phrase seems to be what landed in the press and in the minds of the public, it is only mentioned one other time in the document, here. I don't think the document justifies its headline. The headline says that relative to other countries, we are particularly bad for nature. 
But the document doesn't talk about other countries, it just talks about the UK. The only real comparison this document contained was this one that says relative to the G7 and other small post-industrial countries, we are doing less well. I don't think this supports the claim that globally we are doing less well, particularly as one of the footnotes here takes us to a document about European rather than specifically British agriculture that only mentions the UK specifically to say that the northern UK has grassland of high ecosystem quality value and these are farm types worth protecting. I think this is a little bit ironic as the environmental lobby loves to attack hill farmers, which we talked about the other week. But that's a side point. The data behind this table comes from the Biodiversity Intactness Index from the Natural History Museum. The methodology for this survey is discussed on the website. In our modelling, we assume that human pressures, land use change and intensification, human population growth and landscape simplification have caused the differences we see in biodiversity within each study. I think this is a massive stretch. The land that we farm in Britain has been farmed for centuries, millennia in many cases. We haven't seen a great deal of land use change. And claims that our landscape has been changed greatly by post-war industrial farming, by destroying exactly 50% of our hedges for example, are simply lies. We looked at this in the first episode on the channel and found that the actual figure was more like 17%. So the Biodiversity Intactness Index blames land use change and landscape simplification for any change in biodiversity that we see, but then it doesn't investigate whether those things actually happened at all. We only consider landscape structure and landscape history in very basic ways. No surprise, therefore, that this survey could be used to conclude that farmers are at fault for everything. So at this point I'm not completely convinced. No study is perfect, but some studies are less perfect than others. But even if we are to take the Biodiversity Intactness Index at face value, I'm not sure it supports the claim that this land is one of the most nature depleted places on Earth. They projected their findings on a map, and I think it's reasonable to say that the UK doesn't stand out. It seems to me to be the same colour as a large chunk of America and Canada, better than some parts of South America, South Asia and China, and broadly comparable with a lot of Europe, Western Asia and a fair chunk of Australia. But of course large countries like China, America, Australia have much variation in the colours you see here which will give them a better average score in the index than the UK even if they have much larger expanses of land that are just as bad or worse. So I think at best political boundaries distort these results. The results of this survey are also quite opaque, which I think is a bit unusual for something so high profile. I couldn't find a plain English summary, instead it throws you to these data downloads. At any rate, the conclusion of this survey is that the UK has only half of its entire biodiversity left, putting it in the bottom 10% of the world's countries. We have a biodiversity intactness index of 53%, global biodiversity intactness is about 75% and they think we need to all be above a target of 90%. Again, I'm not trying to dispute the fact that there has been biodiversity decline, but I'm not sure this really stacks. The phrase seems to come from the State of Nature report, which doesn't justify it, and then it's footnoted to this biodiversity intactness index from the Natural History Museum that's based on some really unhelpful assumptions. Being cynical, I think that this phrase Britain is one of the most nature depleted countries on earth is a very successful campaign slogan. It's a piece of PR. It's something that has been selected and amplified by British conservation charities who rely on a sense that in Britain there is an urgent need to support conservation. And I'm able to think this because the British Natural History Museum are not the only people who have looked at things relating to biodiversity all across the globe and tried to put all of the different countries into a nice neat table. Yale University have produced the Environmental Performance Index. This is a comparative set of tables compiled from data from international organisations verified by third parties. It covers lots of different things. Granted, not all of these are strictly relevant to our question about degradation of nature, but nevertheless, the 2024 Environmental Protection Index saw the UK rank fifth overall. The other year I looked at, which was 2022, saw us rank second behind Denmark. This is a different picture. The Biodiversity and Habitat Rankings, which looks at 12 different indicators, puts us 15th. Relative crop yield puts us top of the table because we're really good at agriculture in this country. 
But despite that, for pesticide pollution risk, we rank 39th, and most of the countries above us are not densely populated post-industrial countries. And we are not continually destroying habitats to maintain our production. This would suggest to me that there has not been much land use change or landscape simplification due to agriculture in this country, which is the basic assumption of the Biodiversity and Tachnus Index. The Species Habitat Index puts us at 13th, which is pretty good. On the list of countries with the least endangered species, we rank 18th, which I think is also pretty good. This paints what I think is a much more accurate picture. We do have very productive agriculture in this country, but not with a huge trade-off with nature. But this is not to suggest it's entirely plain sailing. In 2022, on habitat loss, we score 140, which is less good, although I emphasise this is still not in the bottom 10%, as the Natural History Museum claim. The 2022 data also has a few different metrics, like grassland loss, where we rank 43rd, which is in the top half, wetland loss, where we rank 64th, which is less good, but still in the top half, for functioning ecosystem services, we rank 102, which is slightly below average, indicating room for improvement, but it's still not in the bottom 10%, and ecosystem vitality, which combines several metrics regarding how well we are looking after our ecosystems, sees us rank 16th, which is right near the top. So if you look at the Yale surveys, you get a very different picture. We're above average for most things, quite a long way above average for a lot of things, and I don't think we're in the bottom 10% for any of the metrics that I looked at. I think the statement, the UK is one of the most nature-depleted countries on Earth, is trying to make simple a huge number of different things that are incredibly complicated. And it's pushed for by a very specific lobby. And the study from Yale shows that their surveys are by no means without flaws or universally accepted anyway. To claim that we are one of the most nature depleted countries on earth begs a really big question. What is nature? Is nature wildlife? Is it biodiversity, which includes plants? Is it a more holistic view of ecosystems as a whole? Or does nature simply mean unspoilt resources without these other things, which are distinct? But this is being pedantic. The much more interesting question is, when is nature? The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, who as long-time viewers of the channel will know, I probably don't agree with on everything, have this brilliant blog that asks, if we are restoring nature, to which era of our history do we wish to revert? This is a fantastic point. The organicists, for example, in restoring Britain to its natural state, believed that they would be taking us back to the early Middle Ages. They believed that human peasants were part of the native biodiversity. But some today want to take us back to the original state of nature before humans set foot on the British Isles. But you could argue that the present day is just as natural. Presuming there is no god, we are just animals competing with all the others in the great game for survival. That's natural. We just happen to be very good at it. I'm going to conclude with this blog. So, is the UK nature depleted? Technically, yes, if you consider our status from the viewpoint of the Biodiversity and Tachnus Index. But this is only one metric, and frankly presents a message that suits those who demand substantial public investment in nature recovery projects such as rewilding and the repurposing of our land for nature, which will reduce our ability to feed our current and future population and offshore the problem. Our responsibility to nature and biodiversity is not just domestic, it is global too. The point I'm trying to make here is that this phrase we've been discussing is at best reductive, and I think is unhelpful, it's pushed people in the wrong direction. As we will see in future weeks on the channel, nature-friendly farming is often worse for the planet and therefore for nature in the long run, because it's less efficient, which means you have more emissions per unit produced. That is what this phrase drives us to do, look narrowly at our own landscape and export anything that might cause emissions overseas, which is a bad idea for our economy and food security, but also fundamentally will do nothing to stop climate change. Point being, there is a debate to be had here, and to have that debate, I am very fortunate to have become a columnist for something called Scribehound. This is something I'm quite excited about, because it's an opportunity to talk about things and write alongside other prominent havers of ideas, like Joe Stanley, who is the head of sustainable farming at the Allerton Project, which is a sort of experimental farm not far from me. You've also got people in the rewilding movement, like this chap, who predictably has an estate.
and I understand some big names from the modern organic movement are soon to be announced. So all different backgrounds and perspectives are represented. This looks to be a really exciting forum for debate about the future of our countryside. There's also some famous faces on the platform, like Adam Henson, Anna Jones and Alan Titchmarsh. So how this works is every month each of us write an article and every day one is published. We also record them, so they're like mini podcasts if you'd rather listen. And crucially, there is a comment section. Everyone is involved in the discourse and can join in or request articles on topics of interest from certain writers. My first article was essentially introductory, but going forward I'll be using Scribehound to draw bigger conclusions across all of the different things that we discuss on the channel, and I'll be making more policy suggestions than I do here too. My next article is on the nature of rural paternalism. But if you subscribe to Scribehound, you'll also receive the musings of all these other people and all their perspectives as well. And this is a very good way to support my work on this channel because you actually get something for it. I get half of your subscription fee added to what Scribehound pay me each month, which is already more than I get from my YouTube. This graph isn't easy to read, but each point is a month. YouTube pays monthly. I started this channel in January last year, having done a fair bit of preparatory work, and was monetized first in July last year, and in that time I've earned pretty exactly £2,000. Which sounds like a relatively substantial amount of money, but it hasn't covered the cost of my camera and computer, not to mention any other hardware, or software, or travel, or my time. I think the money you get from ad revenue increases in the run-up to Christmas. It's fallen off in 2025. You see January, February, March and April are the lowest earning months I've had bar last July, but I was only monetized part way through that month. So this channel very much does not pay for itself. It takes me two or two and a half days a week, depending. I do have a buy me a coffee for donations and I am eternally grateful for everyone who has supported me on that. I hope you continue to feel responsible for the output of the channel going forward. But I don't really like asking for donations, and I certainly wouldn't if I wasn't losing money. But I don't have to anymore, because you can go over to Scribehound, try it for a month for just a pound, and then you get something for your contribution. And I'll show you some other analytics. In terms of viewer age, we have a very good spread, but with the largest group, people in their late 20s and early 30s. You are overwhelmingly male, with just 9% of my viewers being female. About 44% of views are from the UK, just under 20% from the US, and the rest are fairly evenly spread all over the world. And about two thirds of you are not subscribed, which is something you could alter right now by pressing that button. It is your civic duty. You must also check out Scribehound. And I leave you with the news that the other day I finished my first lambing. We had five Leicester Longwall girls, two Leicester Longwall boys, and no losses. So that was a success. Which comes at a time that the breed is now on the endangered list. So next year, I'm looking forward to having many more. Goodbye.